chipping the way that Tony teaches basically takes a lot of guesswork. So you talked about different carry and roll proportions. Generally, I like to teach the pitching with eight iron, six iron, depending on the cost conditions. We're talking about 50% carry and roll, one third, and then one quarter. So for example, if I'm faced with a downhill chip that normally requires my eight iron, take out the pitching wedge. The key thing is I prep all of them around the same height. Rule of thumb is this, the seven iron is where you grip right to the end of the shell. That approximates the putter height. It gives you more or less the same feel as your putter. You want things to stay more or less consistent. And because you're using a chip and run, the stroke is very, very small. The smaller the stroke, the less it can go on. Hi, this is Kim Sykes from Fort Collins, Colorado, and I play at Mountain Vista Green. This is Golf Smarter number 884. Analyzing Tony Manzoni's Lost Fundamentals Swing Method based on Ben Hogan's Secret with Justin Tang. This is Golf Smarter. Sharing stories, tips, and insights from great golf minds to help you lower your score and raise your golf IQ. Here's your host, Fred Green. Welcome back to the Golf Smarter Podcast, Justin. Thank you, Fred. Thanks for the invite again to talk about Mr. Tony Manzoni. Well, you know, it's interesting because you and I have been, since the first time you were on the podcast, we've talked a lot about Tony and and actually what you've learned from him because you're the type of instructor that likes to absorb what all the other instructors are talking about and incorporate it into your the way you teach golf. And I think that's really amazing. And I truly appreciate, thank you, for uh, using Golf Smarter as one of your resources. Thanks, Fred. I think a lot needs to be said about uh, golf instruction, right? There is no one way. Jack Nicklaus didn't write golf the way, but he wrote it my way. He called it golf my way. Similarly, Mr. Ben Hogan wrote the five lessons. I like to think that he wrote the five lessons more of as a reminder of what he did in his golf swing and not what you should do. Certainly, it provided a framework uh, a roadmap, if you will, for budding golfers looking to improve their technique. But I'm sure a lot of these top golfers slash instructors never meant it to be uh, prescriptive. Now, as a golf instructor, you see golfers of all shapes and sizes, even if they were of the same physical dimensions, everyone thinks differently. And therefore, as an instructor, you need to accommodate for all these uh, nuances in physical build and and uh, cognition, mental cognition. And Golf Smarter has helped me a lot in the sense that it pulled together all these great instructors from around the world. And as an instructor, all, all I can do is learn the various uh, delivery methods. I think most of us are saying more or less the same thing, right? Things like a, a flat left wrist, things like proper weight shift, set up. But all, the key thing is this. All of us are saying it in a different manner. Now, how I describe a proper grip and how you describe a proper grip may be entirely different. My method may resonate with one player. Yours would resonate with another. Now, as an instructor, if you only have one way of doing things and it doesn't sit well with a student, then what happens? You can't just force the student to do it harder or do it more and somehow hope that he gets it. Everyone learns differently. I just cannot emphasize that point more. Well, also the fact that uh, golf my way, not golf the way, and also Ben Hogan's book were written a long time ago and so much has changed, not just in instruction, but the equipment has changed. The balls have changed. The way courses are maintained is radically different than, you know, if you look at old videos of even when Arnold Palmer was playing, you'll see the greens are not as, you know, pristine, like tile floors as they, as they are today. Yes, that's correct. 
So while agronomy has improved a lot, while teaching, the tools we use to teach golf have changed dramatically. The clubs that we've used to play has changed uh, dramatically, especially the ball. I think a lot of instruction has relatively stayed unchanged. Let me explain. A lot of people say that there's this, there's this thing, the more things change, the more things stay the same. Now, one, one non-negotiable from way back in time is this. If you land the club in front of the ball, you will hit the ball and then take a divot. That is non-negotiable. That is never going to change uh, in the next 100 years. All the top players did that. And they did it in a manner that was, uh, they achieved that while moving their body in a manner that was comfortable to them, that was in line with how their bodies were, were made. If that makes sense at all. So if you look mm -hmm. at Ben Hogan, you look at Jack Nicholas, you look at Arnold Palmer, all great ball strikers, all great players, all multiple major winners. All of them did it differently. But the one thing that they did similarly was they struck the ball first. Ball and then turf. That doesn't change. Now, Tony wrote a great book. He, he passed away October 2018, almost uh, five years now. He wrote this book that was based on Ben Hogan's uh, secret letter. So apparently someone came in through his door, one of his uh, golfers on the golf course that he was teaching at came in through the door and said, hey, Tony, I've got this letter from Ben Hogan. And it was a letter from Mr. Hogan explaining how he hit his driver. And up till then, no one really had that sort of information from Mr. Hogan. Now, as Tony watched the video and read the letter, he realized this thing, that Mr. Hogan shifted his center of gravity to the left prior to the completion of his backswing. He had to rewatch that over and over again. So, modern technology today has confirmed that, hey, all good players, elite tour players, elite amateurs, all, their, all of them get their center of pressure less as soon as possible. A lot of elite players actually say that once they get their shaft parallel to the ground on the backswing, they feel like they're beginning to start their downswing. And... Terry Hashimoto, the founder of Body Track, a, a pressure plate, a pressure map uh, uh, tool to see, how, to see where your, your center of pressure shifts on the, the golf swing. He's confirmed that also with uh, the pressure traces. So that's the amazing thing. Although technology has clearly evolved, what the human body has done, is doing, hasn't really changed. Technology is just confirming that. So I wouldn't. Oh, but the irony sorry, of the irony of Tony's video and book lost fundamental. Maybe it should be called. I, I don't think it was lost at all. Yeah. Well, you know, we're talking about Tony Manzoni, and and the reason we're talking about Tony Manzoni is because, as Justin said, he passed away in 2018, and he was a regular on Golf Smarter. For, for many, many years. And uh, over the time that he was on 12 or 13 times, um, I would get letters every single time. I'd get emails every single time of people saying, this guy is figured it out. I don't know what it is, but he sing he's singing to me. He's like, you know, it's like being at one of those concerts and he was looking directly at me. The way Tony was able to explain what he was doing and how he was teaching really resonated with so many uh, listeners in the Golf Smarter community that um, since he passed, we've started running those episodes again. And, and when I like to do it is to open each uh, season, I guess, you know, the golf seasons really kind of starts picking up in March and April. So all during March and April, I take all of those episodes and I run them one week after the other, and we run them on Golf Smarter Mulligans. And so when Justin had talked to me and told me how much he appreciated what Tony was teaching, I thought, what a perfect thing to do is let's kick off the next Tony Manzoni season with some praise on his instruction. And 
maybe even a little bit of insights onto what he was saying. So with all of that explanation, um, I also want to say that like we, when we talked about Ben Hogan, he, his stature, his size, his body was very different than so many amateur golfers. Um, and so even though what he was doing, it was about getting the club, hitting the ball, then hitting the ground, right? Having the bottom of your swing in front of the ball, which is a revelation for so many golfers. Indeed. So instead of uh, Tony, Tony should have called his book The Timeless Fundamentals instead of The Lost mm. Fundamentals because I, I don't think it was lost at all. And a lot of comparisons have been made between uh, Ben Hogan and, uh, for example, Stack and Till, Golfing Machine, Morat. I think there are samenesses and differences. The samenesses are that a lot of, all of them pivot around a single axis, which is the left hip. But how they do it, all of them have some differences to their method. But the beauty of moving around a single pivot axis is this. It prevents you from making massive uh, weight shifts, massive uh, movements of the body and the head, and allows you to allows your contact point. The contact point is basically where the club lands, makes contact in relation to the ball on the ground. It allows it to stay in front of the ball. Now, this was very different in in the times of Mr. Hogan, where the predominant teaching method was to make a massive shift to the right and then make a massive shift to the left. As you, as you can imagine, as you start trying to shift your weight right and left and you don't do it correctly, you're going to move the base of your net off the ball and then you're going to try to move it back on the ball all in a matter of one plus second while swinging a heavy club. I don't think you get very consistent results with that. So mm. Tony, Tony's uh, loss fundamental, if you will, helped a lot of people in the sense that when, when you set up with your weight 60, 40 in the left and it progresses to 70, 30 on the top of the swing, you suddenly take one, one side of the body out of play. You're just shifting around like a door, around a, a fixed axis at the door jam. Nothing else moves. So the less moving parts, the less can go wrong. Now, when people start, start hitting the ball first before hitting the ground, it's going to increase the enjoyment of the game. It's going to create a sense of, hey, you know what? I'm actually quite talented. Let me start practicing other areas of my game. Like, or let's try the last fundamental on the short game, which is Tony's big thing. Tony was always, let's get, let's get you doing the shorter, slower swings correct before you progress. Let's talk a little bit about Tony's approach to teaching. Tony, all right, we're gonna, but we're gonna do Tony's approach to teaching. But you know what I've got to do. We got to take a time out. We'll be right back. <laughs> All right, Justin. And just to make sure that people understand that you're in Singapore. Yes, I am. And a Golf Smarter listener and an instructor there at a, at a country club in Singapore, correct? Yes, I'm based out of the Tanamera Country Club. Tanamera. Um, all right, I want to go back to getting... Uh, more uh, deeply into the 60-40 concept. Can you explain it a little bit more so that we really understand what it meant? Yeah, so uh, Tony always wanted students to set up with more weight on the left leg or the knee side for left-handed golfers. And the whole idea was to rotate around the left hip socket. Now, if you did that correctly, you're going to feel that your right side, the right side of your body is very light. You're not going to put any pressure on your right foot, your, the base of your neck is not going to shift over the right knee. Now, that is absolutely key to hitting consistent shots for most golfers. Certainly, a lot of golfers will take videos, pictures of top professionals and say, hey, look, this guy shifted his head way to the right. Well, yes, he did. It's undeniable that X 
XYZ golfer actually shifted their pressure to the right side. But you got to understand their background. They've been doing this since they were five years old and they've been doing it every day. So that level of coordination that they've trained in their body started at a very young age for a very long time. You picked up golf in your late 40s or 30s, as the case may be. It's not going to happen. The path, your path is very different from the golfer. So there are always exceptions. So there will be some golfers who say, hey, I tried Tony's method, didn't work for me. Again, there will be exceptions. And Tony never sure. said, Tony never said, you do this, you're going to be a scratch golfer. But what I'll say is this, Tony had a very uh, exceptional track record as a college coach. I believe he taught for 29 years at the College of the College of the Desert, and he, he walked away with five state community championships and 28 other titles, conference titles, and, I believe. Yeah, they, they won the, the conference championship 28 years. Yeah, 28, 28 times. Years. That's correct. So yeah. This, yeah. this method, I hesitate to use method, this system that Tony was teaching, as we will get into shortly, produced results over a long period of time. This wasn't a get rich quick scheme or lose 50 pounds overnight type scheme. It stood the, <laughs> it stood the test of time. And as we mentioned earlier in the episode, modern technology has confirmed whatever Tony has, is teaching from Mr. Ben Hogan's lost letter. So a lot needs to be said about that. So while Tony taught this system, he also wanted you to have your own signature about it. If you look at Tony's teachings on the uh, DVD, as well as the uh, book that's available on Amazon, he was never prescriptive about most other things in the golf sense. He certainly didn't prescribe a particular grip. He didn't prescribe a particular look about his thing. It was all about principle. He was happy to let you use your own grip, whatever that felt, whatever felt comfortable to you. So if you are a golfer that is predisposed to having a strong grip, underhanded grip, then just need to know that your backswing is going to be flatter than a guy who has a more on top grip. And consequently, there will be slight differences in the look of your swing and also in the uh, pressure you put in the ground as a result of your grip, but the principle stays the same. So the principles are, are this. Set up with your weight 60, 40 on your left side. Now, the next thing you want to think about is this. If, if for the listeners that are listening to this, let's just put our hands around our body as though we were hugging ourselves and just make a turn to your right, while keeping your right side light. So as you turn to your right side, you want to feel that your weight increases in the proportion of 70 to the left and 30 to the right. Now, as you do that, you will feel that the base of the neck doesn't really shift this way. It doesn't shift to the right. So if it doesn't shift to the right, you don't have to bring it back to the left. And you also notice that your Shoulder turn is not as big as you would think it's necessary. It's certainly not 90 degrees or 100 degrees or 120 degrees as the case may be. Now, we're going to take our hands off our chest. Now, we're just going to put our left arm across the chest. Now, this is the key thing. This is the backswing that Tony taught. That Tony taught. Once you're in your setup, as you take your backswing, while keeping your right side light. You just want to fold your left arm across your chest. That creates a connection between the left upper arm and the left pectoral muscle. Now, as you do that, notice that your left thumb is more or less pointing up. That tells us that the face didn't fan open and it didn't close on the back side. So the cup face is basically controlled by the inclination of the torso and the rotation of it. As you 
Now, as you take a golf club and make your swing, you'll see that the blade should stay fairly square. That tells us if all you continue, or if, you, if all you do on the down swing, and, make, and do not disrupt the inclination of the club face in relation to your torso, you're probably going to get a pretty square face at impact. So these are, again, principles. Now, what was Hogan's secret? Everyone said that he had a secret a cup left wrist. But this is the secret as interpreted by Tony. Mr. Hogan's tailbone went to the left of the target just prior to the completion of his batching. That was the move. That is the move that's going to move your center of gravity, your, your weight distribution, 50, 40, and et cetera, 70, 30, the back swing. And at impact, you want to have 80% of your weight on the left side, 20% on the right side. As you finish, it's going to be 90, 10. So, wow. As listeners incorporate this secret into their game, into their swing, they will notice that the contact point where the club makes contact with the ground will more often than not be ahead of the ball. You're gonna you're gonna create a what I call a hit and run accident with the club face against the golf ball. You will hit the ball first and then a divot. You will automatically have a flat left wrist at impact. You will automatically have sharp lean at impact. This is I need, this is critical. A lot of golfers take a, an 8 iron. They add loft to it. They increase shaft lean. Sorry, they, they decrease shaft lean to the right side. The 8 iron becomes a pitching wedge. Mr. Hogan took an 8 iron. He increased shaft lean towards the target. This 8 iron became a 7 iron. Now think about this, right? When you start leaning the shaft forward, the sweet spot, the tip of six line of the club face, start to make contact with the ball. You lean the shaft backwards, you're going to make contact on the first and second groove of the golf club. Mm. This is why Mr. Hogan and Tour Pro's elite amateurs, their ball flight takes on a totally different trajectory from the average golfer. Just sweet spot contact, just physics. So if you start doing the lost fundamental, you're going to experience this more and more. Now, don't get excited and say, hey, let's go out, get me a small bucket of balls, take a sick time and start doing that. It doesn't work that way. <laughs> so how do we do it? Again, Tony was a, a big advocate of starting small. He would first get you to do the lost fundamental while chipping. So he, he advocated the uh, chip and run Starting with loft style, advocated using a nine, eight, seven, and six iron from around the green. Now, again, set up in the same manner, 60, 40 bias to the left. Uh, grip down on the, call it an eight iron, nine iron. Stand the shaft up, as was common in those days. Again, coming back in vote one tour. As you stand the shaft up, you will find that if the the sole on the toe end of the club that makes contact with the ground. You get a very tiny footprint as opposed to putting the entire club on the ground. Let me just get a club here for you. Mm -hmm. No, get, this is this is one of my secret weapons that I talk about a is, lot is how yeah. Tony taught me to 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 bring the, the, the shaft more upright yeah. and have the toe down Correct. Uh, when you're chipping. To just to get the ball onto the green and rolling. Yeah, so look at this, right? This is the entire sole against the ground. Now, if you stand it mm -hmm. up, it's a very tiny footprint. It's very hard to stop the, the, the chip shot from there. Right. And when you, when you do that, you're going to make contact with the toe side of the club face. You minimize that spin, it produces a very predictable roll of the ball. That's, the, that's the, the, one of the main issues with uh, amateurs when they start chipping. They get too much yeah. shaft lean, they create too much ball speed. So your ball speed and your ball spin, what I say, they do not match. You get a very unpredictable outcome. 
So, all right, listen, another another, another time out, and then and then I want to come back and talk a little bit more about what most of us do as recreational amateur players, uh, how we approach chipping onto the green and yeah. how we're approaching it wrong. But we're going to do that after this. Again, we're, we're, we're just reliving the lessons of Tony Manzoni with Justin Tang, who was introduced to Tony Manzoni by Golf Smarter. I mean, it's not like you ever had a chance to meet him. You only got to hear him on the show, but you read his book. You've, you've watched his video. Um, you know, this idea of uh, chipping up onto the green with a, a eight, seven, eight, nine iron uh, by bringing the shaft more upright instead of leaning it back um, and being up on the toe of the club. The point of this, and I think that a lot of people try to fly the ball as close to the hole as they can and hope it stops, but they don't know how to do that. And most instructors that I've spoken to about chipping onto the green is you want to use as much as the putting surface as you possibly can. You want to get the ball onto the green as quickly as you can but you may not necessarily want to putt from off the green because that rough, whether it's the first or second cut that you're putting over, is pretty unpredictable. You may not know, you know what you're going to get. So you want to get the ball just slightly over that, get onto the green as soon as possible, and let it roll as long as you can. Now, the longer, the, or I should say the lower the club number, so if a seven iron is going to roll a lot longer than a nine or a pitching wedge, because of the loft of the club, correct? That's correct. Okay, so I've uh, interpreted this properly. <laughs> yes, you have. The short game is really interesting, right? This is what I tell both of my players. The information that's in the short game is at least three times that of the long game. Wow. And another thing that I have to my players is let's get it high off the tee and low around the green. That's great. So low around the greens, we always start, can I putt it? If I can't, can I chip and run it? If I can't, I've got to pitch it. And your lob wedge, your your flop shot, that's really only for emergency purposes. It's a shot of last resort. A uh, short game is where you get to express yourself, your creativity. I use, I teach and use all sorts of grips but there are three different heights to grip the club depending on the uh, required shot at hand. So chipping, chipping the way that Tony teaches basically takes a lot of uh, guesswork. So you talked about different carry and roll proportions. Generally, I like to teach it this way. I use the pitching wedge, the eight iron and six iron. Uh, depending on the cost conditions, we're talking about 50% carry and roll, one third, and then one quarter. So, for example, if I'm faced with a downhill chip that normally requires my eight iron, I'd probably take out the pitching wedge. But the key thing is I grip all of them around the same pipe. Rule of thumb is that the seven iron is where you grip right to the end of the shell. That approximates the putter height. It gives you more or less the same feel as your butter. You want things to stay more or less consistent. And because you're using a chip and run, the stroke is very, very small. The smaller the stroke, the less it can go on. And because it's so is slow, it more like a is it more like a putting stroke? Yeah. The great than an actual swing? That's correct. The great Raymond Floyd called it putting with loft. Putting so, with loft? Yeah. So you just set, set up with the shot as though you're going to make a putt. The only difference is this. You want to lean the shot a little bit more forward and just make a putting stroke. Try to get contact on the toe of the club. You'd be surprised with how effective this shot can be. Mm. So when, when you're making a chip and run stroke the, in the manner that Tony taught, it's going to be really slow. Now when it's slow, here's the magic. When it's slow, you're able to feel the loft fundamental working for you. That's the thing, right? Everyone 
conceptually gets the idea of the loss fundamental, they think because I know it, I can execute it. That's as far from the truth as it gets. Now think about this. I'm right-handed. I certainly know how to write A to Z, the 36th alphabet. But that does not mean I can immediately pick up a pen with my left hand and write it at the same speed of my right hand. It just doesn't work that way. There is a process that your, your brain and your body has to go through. It's creating a habit, essentially, before you can execute the various motor movement patterns at more or less the same speed as your dominant hand. Now, if it took me, I'm 43 years yet, it took me 43 years to do a certain, to reach a certain proficiency of a certain task, it's not going to take me just six months of hard work on my non-dominant side to reach that same level of proficiency. Once you have felt the loss fundamental and you can execute it at a fairly good speed with your chipping stroke, then Tony would want you to move on to the pitch shop. So again, nothing else changes. 60-40 on the left. The only difference is you're going to use a 56 or 54 degree. Now, you are able to move your left arm so that it's parallel to the ground on the back swing. Now, as you do that, you're going to incorporate a little bit more of the weight shift that we talked about and get your center of gravity moving so that your weight distribution ends up 70 30 on the left track. Again, the speed and the length of the pitch chart is considerably lower than that of the full swing. As you work through it and feel the loss fundamental, which again is simply shifting your center of gravity to the left prior to the completion of your back swing, you have a better chance of progressing this move when you try to make a full swing with first a seven iron and then perhaps with a trizer or a three wood. Tony was, I don't want to say obsessed with, but he spent so much time studying and analyzing everything he could about Ben Hogan and his swing because he, he just loved, I think he even got to see Ben Hogan play once, wow. um, probably more than once. Um, and he, you know, there's so many times that I've talked to instructors who said, you know, I've figured out. Ben Hogan's secret. And everyone had a different interpretation. Yeah, everyone but Tony certainly seemed had a, to be on to something. Yes. I, I would say Tony is one of the few instructors that that saw Mr. Hogan make that shift to the left. But here's the interesting bit, right? We mentioned earlier about the other great. While Mr. Hogan had a secret, my interpretation besides this uh sense of gravity move was that he knew his string, he knew the various components, he matched them up to make it his string. I think that was his genius. Mm -hmm. I see too many good golfers these days, they go, oh, I want to copy this guy, Adam Scott, so I'll copy Tiger Woods string. But hey, you're, you're built like Yen Wu's no? Why are you trying to copy, say, a Davis Love type of thing? It just doesn't make sense. So if you're six foot four, I think you shouldn't copy the look of Ben Hogan's swing. That's why I tell students, I can help you hit it like Ben Hogan. I may not be able to make you look like Ben Hogan. There's a dramatic distinction there. So I can help you hit a power feed. Yeah, yeah. Tell, tell me what you, exactly that, that difference. Go into detail on that when you talk about there's a dramatic difference there. So Mr. Hogan, how he hit the ball? Very strong trajectory, power feet, right? Hit the ball before you hit the turf. I can help you do those things. But if you if you want your swing to look like Ben Holden's, I may not be able to do that for you. A good starting point is this. If you're built like a Davis Love and you try to swing like a Ben Holden, it's not going to look like Ben Holden at all. <laughs> From the 
from the videos that I've analyzed, it looks like Mr. Hogan's arms were his wingspan. If he were to stand in a crucifix position and you measured him from fingertip to fingertip, it looks like it's more or less the same as his height. Now, if you're a guy like me who's got arms like an eight, very long arms, it's not going to look the same. At the top of my back swing, my arms are going to be further behind me than Mr. Hogan. That means I've got to get them out in front again, so I've got that extra move to make. Now, if my instructor doesn't teach me to make that extra move, or physically I'm unable to do it, or coordinate it mentally, I'm not going to be able to play decent golf, because I'm not swinging according to my DNA. Everyone has a particular DNA. How you rotate on your back swing, which side you favor, whether your head moves right or left, or up and down. All these are predisposition. How you grip the club. All these are predisposition. You do a simple test like this, you can see my thumb goes above the right shoulder. I've got some students who are here. That tells you where your arms should be, what kind of plane you should be using on your back swing, whether it's a high track above the, the, the right shoulder, medium track at the right shoulder, or low track. And your transition, all are determined by your, your, your anatomical proportion in relation to one body part to another. You've got a longer wow. torso versus a shorter torso. How you look like when you address the ball forward selection is all going to look different. For me, for example, if, if I'm not mindful of my longer arms and I go, go to uh, the golf shop and just pick a set of clubs off the rack, off the shelf, I'm not going to play good golf. I need shorter clubs. So guys with longer arms, uh, sorry, guys with shorter arms, you need longer clubs and flatter life. It, the way I explain it, it sounds logical, but a lot of people don't think like that. And there are things that... Uh, All right, we're going to take, we're going to take another time out. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt you. I'm going to take our last time out. I want to come back and start talking about... Um, the full thing. Just picking up right where you left off. Yeah, the full swing. We'll be right back. The main reason I wanted to bring Justin on this week's episode is because this Friday is the renewal of our two months of episodes featuring our conversations with Tony Manzoni, whom we lost to cancer in 2018. As you've heard me say, and as you can tell by Justin's praise, Tony's lessons and appearances on Golf Smarter received more reaction from golfers around the world than any of the 500-plus teachers we featured. And because Tony was not very internet or social media savvy, there's really no place other than Golf Smarter and this podcast where you can learn what made him so special. So this Friday on Golf Smarter Mulligans, we kick off nine consecutive episodes dating back to 2010. But our first one is actually from 2014, when Tony talked about a letter from Ben Hogan that reveals his secret that became an obsession with Tony. I had a fellow walk in my office and tell me, would you like a copy of a letter that Ben Hogan wrote explaining how to hit the driver? He had some private film that he had taken and no one had actually seen a Ben Hogan swing. And I almost jumped in his lap. The first thing I noticed was that Hogan, on the top of the back swing, his weight shifts to the instep of his left foot. And when I read it, I thought, well, I think he means the instep of his right foot. And then I watched the film, and it was very obvious that he was staying on his left side 60-40 throughout the back swing. And I think when you really center your head to the golf ball, you must be a little bit more on the left side than the right side. I noticed that his right hip was aligned on the inside of his right foot. And I just noticed that when he swung, he rotated his shoulders around his spine, and his shoulders really were more level than his earlier swings. And the film that I had was after the accident. And that's really when he said, I'm going to start playing off the left side. That's Golf Smarter Mulligans, episode 200, number one of nine, featuring our friend and mentor, Tony Manzoni. Stay tuned to the end of this episode or check the show notes to learn how to get Tony's book, The Lost Fundamental, One Simple Move, Better Golf Forever, and gain access to his video of the same name. Please subscribe for free to our sister podcast that revisits the best of the Golf Smarter podcast 
called Golf Smarter Mulligans, being released every Friday from wherever you're listening right now. One of the things that Tony really impressed upon me over and over again was keeping your arm attached to your left, for a right-handed golfer, to your left peck or your left tit, as he would say, to um, keep it connected as yes. you're making your swing, Correct. as you're making your full swing. So when you make the golf swing, think about it as an integrated motion, uh, like all other sports. You, you don't hear a separation of arms and body. You don't hear this arm-body debate in other sports. It's not even a thing. It's only in golf, right? Where, oh, no, I feel like I'm swinging more of the arms. And... <laughs> but you know what? You're swinging it with your entire body. If you throw a javelin, you, right. you're not going to just use your arms and throw the implement. It's, the, the javelin's not going to go very far. So think about this as an integrated uh, motion. But at the same time, instruction must be relative, relative to what you feel. So if if a student came to me and he presents a certain motion, I, I might tell the, the student, hey, you know what, just feel that you're using all arms or all body, as the case may be, based on what I'm seeing him do in, uh, in person. So we talk about... Uh, bring the left arm across the chest. That simply allows the body to work in an integrated manner. A lot of uh, beginner golfers, they, they certainly just use the arms just to motivate the club hit. Now, golf swing is not about swinging the club hit. The golf swing is about swinging the entire club. If you think of swinging just the club hit, the left wrist is going to bend like this. So, get it bend like this, you start adding loft. But if you think of stringing right. the entire club, now the left, the left arm stays connected to the chest. How important is this? When you're arm wrestling, right? If you're just using the, the rotation of your upper arm, your shoulder socket, you're going to lose a lot of arm wrestling matches. But if you use your <laughs> so-called body weight, you're going to win more than your fair share of arm wrestling matches. So it's the same. Excuse me. It's the same principle mm -hmm. right, of, of keeping the left arm across the chest. And also maintains a square club face. There is no independent articulation of the elbow joint, no excessive uh, left arm supination or extension of the left wrist where you cup it, flip the club. None of that. And when you do that, the, the whole thing actually feels much slower than you think it should be. Now, when you have the left arm across the chest and you make one golf swing, call it, while your arm and your body are making one revolution, because of the law of the lever, you've got a very long lever now, left arm straight in line with the club shaft, the speed, the miles per hour at the end of the hit is higher than if you had bent your lever. So while you feel slower, the speed is actually much higher because of the unbroken lever. A lot of people go like, doesn't, doesn't feel right. I say, hey, give, give this a shot. And then when they do it correctly, they go like, hey, I'm actually hitting the ball the same distance, if not further, with the same effort. I say, hey, golf becomes much easier that way. Well, just because you're using the club in the way that the manufacturer intended it to be used. Is there a place for flipping? Yes, around the green. Flop shot. Bunker shot. But that, these are the only places where you actually want a cut left wrist at impact or extended left wrist at impact. So there is a time and place for everything. It's, it takes wisdom to know when to use these things. Everything is permissible, right. but is it the time for it? Right, right. A lot of people will compare stack and tilt to what Tony did. What would you, uh, how do you compare the two, and what would you say to people about that? About, so, so, oh, it's just like stack and tilt, the way Tony did it. So again, the thinglessness of this, right, they, they encourage a 
a golf swing, the space of one axis. That's that's where the differences end. So mm. Tony slash Mr. Hogan encouraged a more forward flexion of the torso. It's set up and on the back swing. Back and tail is a little bit different. They encourage a more uh they encourage more extension of the, the upper torso on the back swing. So when you look at these two when when you look at two golfers, one doing a loss fundamental, one doing stack and tilt, you will see that from face on, the stack and tilt golfer will have his, the left side of his body more in a straight line, whereas the Ben Hogan will have his spine tilted slightly more to the right side. So that's the away from the away from the target. Away from the target. And again, you can mm -hmm. see this on the on the the PDF that you're going to spend on. Yeah, but all of them. Yeah. So, so again, these are these are the the main differences. But depending on your 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 build, how you 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 see and perceive certain things in the golf thing, if stack and tilt works for you, and helps you get a flat left wrist and gets your contact point in front of the ball. I think a lot needs to be said about adapting various systems to suit yourself. I certainly oh, don't yeah. want to demonize any methods for single and say, hey, this is the only way or this is not the way. Because for every 10 golfers that say, hey, stack and tilt doesn't work for me, I can show you another 10 guys that work for, that stack right. and tilt work for. Right. You, you show me five guys who say, hey, I got hurt playing stack and tilt, I'll show you five, uh, Physiotherapist who will say this is the best thing for bad backs. Any method will injure you if you don't do it correctly. Well said. I, get, I frequently will get emails from people saying, "So you've had you know so many different people on. What method do you use?" And it's like uh, all of them. You know, it's like I don't incorporate, I take bits and pieces of everything and every that I learn and everyone that I talk to. And some I incorporate more than others and some I'll try it. And if it's not working, I just, I'll not use it anymore. Doesn't mean that it's not right. Um, and that's, that's part of my position here on the show is that I'm not a PGA professional. So I'm not here to judge whether what this person wants to teach is correct or incorrect. What I want to do is put it out there, let the audience absorb it, and use it or not use it, decide for themselves if it's valid or not valid. And if you don't like it, come back next week. You're going to probably hear something completely different. Yeah, that's just a saying in dating, right? He is Mr. Right, just not right now. So I think <laughs> a lot of a lot of concepts that you see discussed in uh, golf media, they are right, but are they right for you? Again, there's not so much about about whether it's correct. It's it's relative. Does it does it resonate with you? That's the thing. I discussed this with uh, some other instructors before. I said there's only one non-negotiable in the golf swing that every one of us can agree upon. It's not how you set up. Because if you look at setups and you spectrum it, some guys aim way right, some guys aim way left, some have a very weak grip, some have a very strong grip. Back swings, again, another another area where that ton of spectruming can be done. You've got a Matt Wolf uh, back swing, and then on the other end, you've got a Ricky Fowler back swing. In fact, it's another area where there's a lot of spectruming. you got guys up on their toes, uh, guys like Dustin Johnson, more, more squatted, more rotated. Then right arm, uh, Joaquin Neiman, Mito Pereira, and then you got on the other end you got guys who like Brian Gay, fully extended. Ben Curtis foot fully extended. So lots of spectruming at a uh, P7 impact. But one thing that all these guys can agree upon is they're trying to. Get the club hit to land slightly in front of the ball so that we hit ball and then turn. That is non-negotiable. So what I do with students is generally this. 
Let's try to make a sound in front of the ball using the club head. Now, how you do that, what you look like when you do that, is going to be different from the guy in the next uh, B. But the key thing is this. All of you are hitting the ball first and then taking a dither. And then from there, now we've got a pretty decent canvas to work around. Then we start optimizing certain things. Is your grip suitable for you? We put them through a battery of tests. Is the ground forces that you use uh, compatible with your grip, for example? Is your anchoring, are all these things compatible? And then we start this journey towards optimizing your golf swing. But we never lose sight of the non-negotiable. Not fundamentals could be one of the systems that I use. The stack and tilt could also be one of the systems that I use. The right side that swing could also be one of the systems that I use. But I never lose sight that these are me merely delivery methods of helping me get the student create the non-negotiable. Now, when I am able to do this with students, they are what I call swinging according to their DNA. It, and when you swing according to your DNA, it's very difficult to forget on the first tee. Now, if you're predisposed to making a little shift to the right and suddenly I say you've got to go stack and tilt or, or vice versa, on the first tee, you're going to be confused. But if you swing according to your DNA and say, hey, ball to the target, and then I need to, to get ball to the target, I need the club hit to make a sound in front of the ball. How difficult is that? Just stick and implement. After this, Fred, just take a stick and make, make a sound against the carpet. You will see that your body will self-organize and do whatever is necessary to carry out the intention. Not difficult. Just think, don't think of the golf club as a golf club because when you do that, you suddenly have this, a lot of preconceived ideas about what you should do with the club. But instead, just look at it as a stick. Make a sound against the ground. If your right arm straighten, so be it. If you get, if you have to do it with more rotation of the torso, so be it. But let's get that non-negotiable going first, and then we can Absolutely. start optimizing the other components of the golf swing. Excellent, excellent advice. Well, again. Um, Justin has put together a really nice PDF that honors uh, Tony Manzoni, but it also goes deep into um, what he's learned from Tony uh, and also comparing it to Stack and Tilt that he's been teaching for quite a while. And uh, I am going to put this all on uh, this PDF. I'll make this available on the blog post um, at golfsmarter.com for this episode. And also we'll make sure to remind everybody that Tony's book is available on Amazon. We've been able to get it republished, uh, and it's available on Kindle format as well. It's called the lost fundamental one simple move, better golf forever. And if you're interested in the DVD that he created, that's no longer in print as well, but here at Golf Smarter is the only place you're going to be able to find it. We have a link for it on a private YouTube channel that uh, we can get it out to you as well. So we, we really look forward to having uh, all of you reach out and start listening to Golf Smarter Mulligans and you'll hear Tony Manzoni. You'll get, if you have not heard him before, you're going to understand what we're talking about. And if you have, you're going to be glad you're listening to it again because you always find a new nugget whenever you're listening to Tony. Justin, thanks so much for your time, your patience, and your energy in putting this together. Thanks, Fred. Do you mind if I complain about a good thing? <laughs> the bad weather that's gripping the U.S. these days has delivered more rain in Northern California than we've had in years. The great thing is that we really, really need the water and the snow that has been absent during this state's driest period on record. But it's really been tough to get out and play, at least for a weather wimp like me. I, I can hear so many of you in the northern states of the continental U.S. rolling your eyes and yelling at me to shut up because every year you have to wait anywhere from four to eight months to get out and play in short sleeves. 
So I apologize to you and want you to know that I understand and feel your pain. But a couple of weeks ago, we had a break for a few days and I got to go out for a full round at one of my favorite and most challenging courses, Foxtail North in Sonoma County. Again, I've not played regularly since November and haven't practiced in my yard that much either. Well, the round started out pretty well, getting pars on number one and number two. Number three is a par three that I, I hit a low shot that actually rolled up and gave me a shot at birdie, which I made. Number four, a par five. Great drive. Laid up for position. And then I overshot the green by about four yards on my third shot, but actually chipped in for birdie. Okay, two under after four holes. Yeah, I shot a 39 on the front, but then it all went downhill, scoring a 51 on the back. There was something weird going on there because I couldn't get the yardage on my clubs right. So I went to my local club fitter last week, who's also a playing partner, and asked him to check the lie angle of each of my irons, especially my 5, 7, and 9 irons. First thing he noticed was that the shaft on my 7 was bent. Okay, now we're getting somewhere. And while I was there, I mentioned that I was considering taking the 4 hybrid out of my bag and replacing it with a 5 wood. We started testing different fairway woods, and he asked me when the last time I was fitted. It was actually about nine years ago that we put a four wood and a new driver in my bag. He then observed that he'd played enough times with me to know that my swing and my game has evolved since then, and it was time to replace the four wood with a three wood and that hybrid with a five wood because I was hitting some of the new clubs about 20 yards longer than the old ones. So I'm hoping to get my new clubs and some new shafts later today, but we've got rain predicted for the next two weeks. So I won't be able to report my progress until things warm up. And they better warm up soon because I've got a trip to Bandon Dunes scheduled for June and want to make sure I'm playing to my potential. And yes, I'll be doing at least one episode on Bandon Dunes in the next few months. Stay tuned for that. I want to thank Tim Seitz of Fort Collins, Colorado. Tim is selected to receive a glove and glove storage compartment from our buddies at RedRoosterGolf.com, the unique glove subscription service that offers many styles of gloves in 26 sizes. You, too, can win a Golf Smarter gift and have your choice of which you'd prefer. And here's all you have to do. Send an email to golfsmarterpodcast at gmail.com and request our simple instructions to leave a voicemail at our toll-free Golf Smarter line. And when you do, you can choose one of three gifts. You can get a dozen balls with the Golf Smarter logo from Odin Golf, the golf brand that sponsors and pays everyday golfers. These tour quality balls are a fraction of the price of what you'll usually pay. And when you use the code GOLFSMARTER at checkout, you'll receive an additional 20% off the order. Their link is in today's show notes. You also have the option to receive a private online link to Tony Manzoni's video of The Lost Fundamental. And that third choice is the glove and glove storage compartment from RedRoosterGolf.com. So please, send an email, and I'll get back to you with some simple instructions of what to do and what to say. Just write to Golf Smarter Podcast at gmail.com or click on the Hey Fred button at golfsmarter.com. And lately I've been posting more short content from the podcasts on social media. So please follow at Golf Smarter on YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, or Fred Green, that's green with an E. I'm the content creator from Novato, California on LinkedIn. If you have any questions, comments, or suggestions for upcoming episodes, I'd love to hear from you. Click on the Hey Fred button when you visit golfsmarter.com.